Um, it was a little bit late that I realized that the focus here is on microscopy and spectroscopy. So that's why I changed the title um, shorthand uh, yesterday. So I'm, I'm going to talk about near field Raman spectroscopy and control. And before I do this, I would like to thank, of course, Reshef and also Tomas for having me in this program. I'm very happy to participate. Okay, then I would like to acknowledge the people who did all this work. Um, this uh, project is 20 years into the game. I'm sorry for the background noise. It's, it's a helicopter going by. Um, so um, our work in this area started with Achim Harchu, um, who is now at the LMU Munich. I will not introduce all the gentlemen. I just mentioned the, the work is being continued now by Kladuri Chanan, and I will uh, highlight his most recent work towards the end of this talk. Good, so this is uh, a short outline uh, of what I'm going to present. Um, I will talk mostly about carbon materials. So these are carbon nanotubes, graphene, then linear carbon chains, then very recent work, uh, carbon heterodox structures, and then uh, something is a bit exotic, levitated spectroscopy. Okay, so um, tip-enhanced or near-field Raman uh, spectroscopy builds on the achievements of near-field optics. Um, what you see here, um, this is a generic optics experiment. You know, we have a target, we shine light in, and we analyze the light that is scattered. Now what's different in near-field optics is that we take this material system, we split it in two. Now, one entity that we usually call the probe is very well characterized. And the other entity that we call S here, sample, okay, is the unknown quantity. Now, by actually using or exploiting the degrees of freedom between the probe and the sample, we extract the near field interaction and thereby we increase um, our information content. So probe and sample. And here I would like actually to highlight the first person who um, thought about these ideas. This is Edward Hutchinson Singe. Um, Edward was actually not a scientist. Um, he got just inspired by you know, popular literature. Um, but he communicated the idea that he had to Albert Einstein. And there is a letter actually. Um, basically evidencing this, uh, this, this interaction. And I was very happy that I got access to the, to the Einstein. So this is the letter that he sent to Einstein. And this is a drawing in the letter. So what you see here is a particle. And he basically argues that I'm going to irradiate this particle in total internal reflection that will generate a very local field. And this local field will expose here this biological section in very close proximity. And in order then to generate an image, he says, I have to rest to scan this sample, which he calls a biological section on cover glass. I have to rest to scan this and acquire here the scattered light pixel by pixel. So, to my knowledge, this is the very first mention of scanning at all in the context of microscopy. Okay, this is uh, going back to 1928. Okay, so today um, we understand this near field microscopy in, uh, in terms of a scattering series. So again, we have this entity calling probe and the other one sample. We shine light in and we analyze the light going out. And this light going out, we can write as a scattering series. So this is uh, similar to um, a Born, Born uh, series um, um, in, in, in scattering theory. So we have the zero component where basically the light only scatters off the sample. Then we have the second term where light only scatters from the probe. Then we have off the sample, then the probe and so on. 
And ultimately we have one term that goes to the probe, to the sample, then back to the probe and then out. Now in principle, you always have all these terms, but depending on your implementation of your microscopic technique, one or the other term will be dominant. And in tip enhanced Raman scattering is this term, the PSP term that is dominant. So what you see is the probe, the probe that acts actually as an antenna is in the game twice. It is like a receiving element that concentrates the incident radiation on the sample. And then it's the transmitting element that basically frees, okay, the material response and scatters it to the far field. Okay, so um, over the past years, okay, we exploited um, many different probes. We call them optical antennas, just in analogy to um, um, radio wave engineering. If I go back, I can think, okay, of the sample also as a receiver, a cell phone, okay. And then here I have my enabling device. It's the antenna that allows me to communicate with uh, free, free space radiation. So in the same spirit here, our probes are called optical antennas. We had tips, we have particles, we have rods. Then we have hybrids where we stack different size particles on top of each other. Now, all these probes are very hard to fabricate. So since very recently, we actually um, um, we, we moved to what is called template stripped gold pyramids. So what you do is you etch a you know um, um, a pyramid or a wedge into into silicon, and then you fill it with gold, and then you put glue inside and you pull this pyramid out and then you have it on on top of a of a probe so it's this gold here okay that ultimately is the optical antenna and you can make it very sharp um, it is only limited by you know the the etching accuracy um, in silicon okay so uh, using these template stripped gold pyramids, um, we routinely uh, achieve resolutions on the order of 18 nanometers. This is an image of single molecules. This is fluorescence, this is not Raman, but uh, we scan, okay, the pyramid, okay, pixel by pixel over the sample surface. And whenever there is a molecule, we get a fluorescence signal. Okay, now that these different patterns also give us an indication how these molecules are oriented. I'm not going to talk about this. But once we position a gold pyramid over such a molecule and we pull the gold pyramid back, then this is the signal as it fades away. So you see that the signal is very localized to like five to 10 nanometers. And this is the, the, what, what enables the spatial resolution. Okay, um, so what we like to do is not to do fluorescence because we heard, um, you can do this very well with uh, localization microscopy. Um, what we like to do is to use spectroscopic techniques that typically provide resolutions on the order of a micrometer and push them down to the nanometer scale. And here the focus is on spectroscopy. So trying to understand what the material is if I have no information about the material. Good. So um, this is the yellow area that we like to cover. So we basically want to have molecular and functional information and the resolution as I alluded to in the nanometer scale. So basically simple, um, I introduced Singh, okay. Um, he is basically one of the pioneers of near field microscopy. We take Raman, okay. And the technique that uh, is typically called tip enhanced Raman scattering. So, what are we aiming for? Um, we are interested in carbon materials, and especially uh, not the material itself, but um, um, the engineered properties. So, that means in dopants or defects that we generate. So this is in similar to semiconductor devices. We don't use uh, the semiconductor per se. 
We use it as a host to introduce dopants, we generate heterostructure, and so on, and, and uh, thereby we generate functionality. So the idea here is the same. If um, carbon makes its entry into um, electronics or optoelectronics, we would like also to control the defects and the dopants. Okay, so again, this is near field um, Raman scattering. So um, we send in here uh, uh, um, light uh, with a frequency omega zero. And let's say we have um, a molecule and it has, it has typical um, vibrations um, and, and, and uh, I labeled those omega n. Then Raman scattering is nothing else than the mixing of these two frequencies. So I'm generating here some and different frequencies. So in the spectrum that I analyze here, I can then recover, okay, these modes, these vibrational modes of my sample. And this is a chemical fingerprint which allows me to um, identify the material. Okay, so here on the side, we have um, 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 a data set uh, that visualizes how this is being done. Here is the spectrum that is being updated in real time. And here you have a running pixel. And so whenever the tip goes here over um, this, this is a carbon nanotube bundle. Whenever it goes over it, then you see that we get a characteristic Raman spectrum with different uh, lines. Good, so let me now give you a few examples. Um, the nicest nanotubes um, that we played with have been actually done by uh, Ernesto Joselevich at Weizmann Institute. Um, we had a very active collaboration back then. And what he managed to do is to generate these serpentine nanotubes. Um, so they were actually grown on miscut, slightly miscut uh, quartz, and quartz nicely had these atomic steps and the nanotube during its growth process nicely aligned along these steps. Right, so um, here you see such a serpentine nanotube and this is now an image that is a confocal Raman image. The resolution here is on the order of lambda half, so about 300 nanometers. And we're imaging here, the contrast in the image is the intensity of this vibrational line. This is called the G-band in nanotubes. So if we take the same image here with the near field Raman, then we get the same information, but of course, um, better resolution and better signal to noise. So typically uh, the resolutions are determined uh, by the sharpness of our gold pyramids and we achieve about 15 nanometers. Now, there are different vibrational lines. So in principle, there is no reason why I should In fact, for every image pixel, I get a full spectrum. So I can generate many images for different vibrational modes. So um, in, 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 in the field, this is called a hyperspectral image. So here you see a data set. Here you see a G line. Then this is a radial breathing mode. And here we have a D band and you see the D band is very much localized to this catalyst particle. So what I didn't mention is, of course, in, in, in addition to these Raman images, we also get the topography because it's, a, it's an atomic force microscope, if you want. So we are also scanning the topography of this sample. But here you don't see the nanotube. It's completely buried in these catalyst particles. So in the Raman image, because we tune to very specific uh, vibrational bands, we can make this nanotube appear. And this band here, D band, which is in a graphene lattice is actually um, uh, forbidden by selection rules. But um, you see that this is only uh, visible close to this giant catalyst particle. Okay, um, we can go along nanotubes, okay, try to understand, okay, what is happening locally. For example, in this case, we have a transition uh, from a semiconducting to a metallic nanotube. This is seen because the radial breathing mode jumps here from one value to another value. 
There's also a signature of this transition um, in here, this uh, 2D band. Um, I, I won't go into the details, but I just want to highlight that a lot of information is contained in such Raman spectra. So what we have here is indeed a transition from a semiconducting to a metallic uh, nanotube. Good, so let me now talk about graphene. I mentioned already this D band. This D band is Raman forbidden. Um, so you need a defect in order um, to, to um, relax the momentum um, um, conservation condition. So um, one of the nice defects is just the edge of, um, of graphene. Okay, um, here I just highlighted, okay, um, uh, the directions, okay, how, how these carbon atoms move for the different modes. Good, so, so here we have a, a nice uh, set. Uh, this is confocal, this is not near field, but this is a graphene uh, piece. Um, about two microns in diameter here. And then you see the G band, here you see the 2D band, and you see that the D band, this D, it's, it's D stands for defect or disorder, is localized to the edge because the edge, you no, know, that's an edge is a, is a defect. Good, so now we use near field Raman techniques to try to understand how well is this D band localized to the edge. Here um, is a data set again. So on this upper side here, we have graphene and down here, there is no graphene. Okay, so you see as we get to the edge, because there are fewer and fewer carbon atoms, this G band and this 2D band, they fade out. You know? Whereas the D band is localized just to the edge. Now we get a localization of 30 nanometers here with near field, but, um, ultimately, this is the resolution of our technique. It's not the localization. So then we realized we don't need any near field Raman in order to measure this localization because we are not trying to distinguish two such regions. We just want to know where this region is. And so we basically can make use of what has been done in localization microscopy and apply it here too. And this is what we've done. So here is again a graphene ribbon and you see the D band localized here. And now just using this prior information that there is graphene and then here is no graphene allows us then, okay, to um, to um, uh, retrieve, okay, this localization of the D band with an accuracy of about three nanometers. Okay, so now you know, okay, um, we've done this for different temperatures as well. It scales with the inverse root of temperature. So what we learned here is um, the mean from this D band localization, we can extract the mean free path of a photo excited electron because we excite this electron, but ultimately the electron has to scatter from a defect in order to become Raman active. So it has to travel to the edge, where it is scattered. And this is exactly what we're probing here with the D band. So now let me go to linear carbon chains. Linear carbon chains are just one line of carbon. And chemists, try to synthesize this for a long, long time. They actually manage, but uh, this beast falls apart when you have about 20 to 30 carbons. So it was Thomas Pichler who managed to grow these linear chains inside nanotubes. And in fact, this can be grown to a length of uh, several hundred nanometers. There's evidence also from the TEM. You see here, okay, this, this line here. And this is, of course, um, assumed to be um, a linear carbon chain. Um, so um, we then also used near field Raman to provide a proof that this indeed is a linear carbon chain. 
So what you see here is a topographic image. This is a carbon nanotube, it's a double wall carbon nanotube. So we have two nanotubes here. Okay. And these are the regions here where we have a linear carbon chain. Why do we know that? Because what you see in color, this is the intensity in this, in this LCC band. So this is the Raman line that is very specific to this linear carbon chain. I would also like to point out that it's, it's actually fantastic. Um, if you normalize this Raman response to the atom, okay, how, how much Raman do you have per carbon atom? This is the strongest ever reported Raman scatterer. So this actually outperforms, okay, um, other uh, materials by two orders of magnitude. So uh, there are reasons why this is so strong, okay? It's, it's, uh, there's a band gap, there's a resonance enhancement and so on, but I, I, I will skip through this for the sake of time. Okay, so um, since very recently we moved from these gold pyramids to double gold pyramids. And this is done by a collaboration we have with a Brazilian group, Adojorio. And uh, on top of the carbon, uh, of, of this pyramid, okay, we, they grow another pyramid. And, and the height of this pyramid is made just such that, that it is resonant with the incident radiation. The pyramids that we used before, they are actually very broadband. There is no resonance. They don't re respond to one particular wavelength of our incident radiation. So these can be made resonant. And this is what we use since very recently. That allows us to generate really giant enhancement and do this analysis of localizing these linear carbon chains um, very routinely. Now I have to ask Rejef um, how much time I have left. Um, another seven minutes. Thank you, thank you, because the clock doesn't show on my monitor. Yeah. Good. So um, we, can, we can acquire these Raman spectra from these linear carbon chains as a function of excitation energy, and we get a resonance profile that allows us to extract uh, the, the band gap um, of these uh, linear carbon chains. Um, so here's this resonance profile. So the, the, the band gap here is about two, two EVs. And then we can also correlate the Raman peak specific to the linear carbon chain with the radial breathing mode of the encapsulating nanotube. And what we see is that there is a correlation. And this correlation indicates that the carbon chain is not responding on its own, but it is actually influenced by the encapsulating nanotube. So there's a Van der Waals interaction, and this Van der Waals interaction influences here where the um, Raman line is. Good, so now let me go to very current work. Um, here I'm just going to throw in what we're working on currently. Um, so this is our inventory of carbon materials. No, there is the carbon nanotube. We've also, I didn't talk about this, we, talk, we also measured um, uh, buckyballs, graphene, and since very recently we are looking in these linear carbon chains. So, so in principle, we exhausted all these allotropes of carbon. So I think the next thing that is of interest are combinations of these different allotropes. And there were very big re surprises um, recently by just looking at two sheets of graphene on top of each other. And uh, it, it's fantastic that you can tune the response of, a, of, of such a material from superconducting to insulating. So um, that's what we're doing right now. We're looking at uh, twisted bilayer graphene 
trying to understand um, the optical response due to these uh, twisting angles. Another um, direction that we are taking is combining spectroscopy with optical trapping. So I'm highlighting here um, Arthur Ashkin, who is the inventor or the pioneer of uh, laser tweezers and optical trapping. So we would like to combine basically um, uh, what he um, pioneered with, with spectroscopy. So we are levitating particles in vacuum. And at the same time, we would like to analyze its spectroscopic response, its Raman response. Okay, so we call it LERS. Okay, so we take optical trapping plus vibration, okay, and we call this uh, levitated Raman scattering. Why would we like to do this? Because ultimately, every signal to noise is dependent on the background signal. So if you have anything on a surface, then the surface gives you a response on its own. And that limits actually the, um, the signal to noise in your, in, in your measurement. So if you have a levitated object, it's completely disconnected from its environment. So all we have is the response from the object itself. And ultimately our response is purely shot noise limited. Good, so we have initial experiments done, okay, with silicon and some um, uh, lanthanides. What we're also looking is not only Raman scattering, but also um, acoustic um, uh, modes, so brio scattering. Um, this is not our work, this is from the literature, so we know where to look for these responses. Now what is interesting here is, yeah, I'm, I'm going to skip through this. We'd we'll just like to emphasize one interesting thing here. This levitated particle can be rotated. And it can be rotated at a very high, 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 high frequency. Okay, so this particle has a typical diameter of about 100 or 200 nanometers. And if you rotate it with, you know, one gigahertz, that amounts to... Um, where do I have this? Sorry. Yeah. This amounts, okay, to an acceleration of a surface atom by 10 to the minus 9 G. This is just a centrifugal force. Now, we cannot rotate any faster because if we rotate a little bit faster, the whole, whole material blows apart. So we are rotating here close to the material damage and we can generate an incredible stress on this material. So what we like to do with Raman scattering is to understand how the Raman response changes as we approach the damage threshold of the material. Good, so um, I'm at the end here, okay. Um, I talked um, mostly about tip-enhanced Raman scattering. I talked a little bit about, you know, what we are working on right now, the levitated Raman scattering. Uh, this is a summary here, and so thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Lucas, uh, for your uh, very interesting talk. Uh, uh, I take the liberty to have uh, uh, one question to you. You showed the Raman uh, of, of a nanotube, which actually uh, it has an inflection point uh, where two nanotubes uh, 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 bridge together into a single nanotube. Did you take the Raman spectrum of this inflection point and did you see any detailed information from the pentagon there or the heptagons, whatever you have there? Yeah, we, we tried. Uh, unfortunately, the resolution was not sufficient. So, of course, we get the Raman response from left and right, and that dominated actually the signature. So, we, we were not able to specifically okay, um, extract the information from the transition region. Okay.